I'm Sarah Kensier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, out this September. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. This week's Gaslit Nation early show, available to listeners at the truth teller level and higher on Patreon, is a big deep dive discussion into Putin's Cold War rematch. We'll play some clips from it now. If you have any awareness of this situation, any understanding of the historical context in the present context, you know that this is a humanitarian catastrophe. You know that Russia has historically been an imperialist power, a colonialist power, and they took Crimea. You know, and before that, Russia had made similar incursions in Georgia, you know, constantly, constantly trying to reclaim territory that is not theirs. Like if you oppose imperialism when the United States is doing it or war, like, for example, if you oppose the war in Iraq, which you should have, uh, if you oppose what Israel does to the Palestinians, if you oppose what China does to the Uyghurs, I mean, I could go on and on. This is the same thing, only it's also wrapped up in this broad, deeply corrupt alliance of oligarchs, plutocrats, transnational organized crime, which is deeply immersed in white collar crime. You know, the reason I'm saying this is actually not to call people out, not to bitch people out, but to encourage them to look at it this way. Because I think that there is solidarity among, you know, a great number of very frustrated Americans, frustrated Ukrainians, frustrated Russians, anybody who has had to deal Uh, with these abuses of power from a military industrial complex, from, uh, you know, corrupt actors, from the people who have caused incredible uh, income inequality, hoarding of wealth, hoarding of opportunities. You know, if you oppose that, if you oppose those sorts of actions, uh, you know, you should oppose what the Kremlin is doing and you should oppose what American backers of the Kremlin are doing, which which tend to be, again, you know, big corporations, incredibly greedy, corrupt people. If Putin goes deeper into Ukraine, he's going to send more refugees into Europe, which is going to inflame the far right anti-immigration parties that the Kremlin props up across Europe both financially and with disinformation and propaganda support. And we also answer questions from our listeners at the Democracy Defender level and higher. So sign up today to get access to all that and help support the show. We have a special episode today with a special guest. Uh, Back in June 2021, we did a Gaslit Nation episode called Voter Suppression Emergency, where we interviewed election integrity expert Ari Berman. And guess what? We are still in a voter suppression emergency. So Ari is back to share his thoughts with us yet again. Uh, Ari Berman is a writer for Mother Jones who closely documents dark money, voter suppression, and the ever-changing laws that GOP legislatures are using and abusing to hijack our democracy. Ari has long followed the power struggle for progressive values and democracy in Washington. His books include Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America, and Herding Donkeys, The Fight to Rebuild the Democratic Party and Reshape American Politics. So welcome back to Gaslit Nation. Hey guys, thank you for having me back. It feels like the the voter suppression emergency has now turned into a voter suppression apocalypse, but I'm sure we will get into all of it soon. Well, actually, you know what? Go on, because I was going to ask you, you know, we spoke to you, gosh, what is it, January, six months ago, half a year ago. You know, what's your lay of the land here? Like, what's changed since we've talked to you? Has anything in particular surprised or disappointed you? Where are we going from here? 
Yeah, well, so if we talked in the summer of 2021, I mean, at that point, a number of states had already passed laws to make it harder to vote. And since then, more states have passed laws uh, to make it harder to vote. So basically, if you look at what happened in 2021, uh, 19 states passed 34 new laws, making it more difficult to vote, which was really unprecedented. Uh, We haven't seen that since the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And I think you have to go all the way back to the end of Reconstruction to find a period when voting rights was restricted in such a dramatic fashion in such a short period of time. But there was this glimmer of hope in the summer that maybe Democrats would do something to stop it. Maybe they would actually pass legislation to stop these voter suppression efforts. And we learned recently that that is likely not going to happen. And so it's a very frustrating and dispiriting moment. I feel like there was this really once in a generation opportunity to protect voting rights that Democrats had with their very narrow majorities in Washington. And basically because of two senators, it's not going to happen. Of course, it's 52 senators if you include the 50 Republicans that voted against the voting rights bills, but it really is two Democratic senators, Manchin and Cinema, that blocked it from happening. And when I was thinking about when you're talking about your intro about corruption, rising corruption and autocracy around the world. I'm just thinking this is a story about corruption and autocracy in Washington, about two people that decided to protect dark money. And really, essentially what Manchin and Cinema did is they they prioritized the rights of the Republican minority over the rights of minority voters. And they prioritized dark money and big money influence over making sure that everyone has the chance to vote. Yeah, absolutely. I know, Andrea, you probably want to get into cinema because I'd like to break these these folks down one by one. So so go ahead with your uh, cinema questions. Yeah, so we've been covering both Mansion and Cinema a lot on this show. And we did an early episode uh, early for in the year of 2021 saying Joe Manchin gaslights America. Like, we saw all this coming, that they couldn't be trusted. And so and in terms of where we go next with these guys... There was a a local news reporter in Arizona who covers local government there who was telling MSNBC that his sources close to cinema are telling him that she has her eye on a bigger prize, which is 2024, either as a presidential run or a VP run, but she wants all of it. Like She's going big in 2024. And it seems like that would certainly be the case. We've outlined reasons why on our show, and also because the Democratic Party is openly declaring war on her, right? You have Voto Latino saying they're going to primary her. Uh, she's been censored by the Arizona Democrats. Uh, you have all these abortion health care groups pulling their endorsements. And so she, she the, the writing's on the wall for her. And so what do you think in terms of that? Do you think it's headed there that cinema might not run for re-election in 2024? Do you think she might switch parties before 2024, which could tip the balance of power in Congress, do you think she would, and if she were to do that, would you see her going independent because she's the quirky girl of the Congress? Or do you see her being a full-blown Republican? I mean, I think her political career is over. I think she ended her political career when she prioritized the filibuster over protecting voting rights. And, and here's why. There's no way she's going to win another Democratic primary in Arizona. Uh, they have already found some good people to challenge her, either members of Congress or other members of the state legislature, someone's going to step up and challenge her. So I don't think there's any way she wins another Democratic primary. I don't think she wins a Republican primary, though, either. If you look at who is running in the Republican Party right now in Arizona, it's QAnon insurrectionist types. They're not going to vote for her. She's way too moderate for the insurrectionists. And so what is she going to do? She's going to somehow win an independent ticket, get enough votes from Democrats and Republicans in a two-party system to become an independent, then I guess anything is possible, but that seems very unlikely to me. It seems like there's really no place for her in the Democratic Party anymore, and I don't think there's any place for her in the Republican Party. I think she's a useful idiot for Republicans. I think they like her to vote against Democratic bills, but I think ultimately they want a Republican in Arizona. They don't want Kirsten Sinema. And so I don't see how she recovers from this. I think the idea that she's going to run for president is completely laughable. She has no qualifications to run for president. She has no personality to run for president. She doesn't even hold town halls in Arizona. How how would she ever deal with the scrutiny that comes with running for president? So I think her career is over and I don't know why she did it. I don't, if you're going to end your political career, wouldn't you want to end it fighting for voting rights, not preserving 
a relic of Jim Crow. It just honestly, nothing she does makes any kind of sense to me, both substantively or politically right now. I think what you described in terms of somebody that should not be running for president because of they're just not qualified, they don't have the charisma, they would just be a terrible candidate. None of that has stopped people like <laughs> Ted Cruz from running for president. And as cinema is someone that has a massive lack of self-awareness. And so I could see her running as an independent or a Democrat on some unity ticket with some posh Trump in this sort of gaslighting campaign to bring the polarized country together. So I wouldn't put it past her given how she behaves in this. I mean, I guess like she could be recruited for some sort of no labels ticket with Joe Lieberman or something like that. But I don't think <laughs> there's any real, the point is, I don't think there's any constituency for that in American politics. I think that's been shown over and over and over. I mean, Ted Cruz was popular with elements of the Republican base. I mean, he had a constituency. Uh, he had no personality, but he had a constituency. And I don't think that cinema has a constituency right now. I mean, I think basically her constituency, I guess, would be the sort of Jeff Flake Republicans. Well, those people are ext extinct right now. I mean, they're being they're being extinguished. So I just don't see where she goes from here. I think that one thing that did not get nearly enough attention was the fact that cinema and mansion are two of the coziest Democrats with corporate America, two of the coziest Democrats with dark money. And they killed the bill that would have cracked down on both dark money and voter suppression. And there was a big, big, big campaign by corporate America, by dark money groups like the Chamber of Commerce, like the Heritage Foundation, to target cinema and mansion. And it was successful. And I feel like all of the media coverage made it seem like they were standing on principle to uphold the filibuster, as opposed to they had been bought off by big money interests that wanted to preserve the filibuster. So they not just could block voting rights, but block all sorts of progressive changes in America. And to me, that was a huge storyline that was just completely missed by all of the inside the Beltway coverage of this issue. Not here at Gaslit Nation. I do not you guys, but you <laughs> which, know. Is, which is why Ari, I just want to point out to our listeners, Ari was like slid into our DMs, was like, girls, I'm coming back on the show. <laughs> so yes, is, so Ari's so. here by his own invitation because he knows he has an open invite here at Gaslit Nation. Um, and so, I saw so much corruption I needed to talk to you guys. Again. Of course, we're all venting around a cheesecake right now. I wanted just to say, but, but Kirsten Cinema is on a fundraising rampage. Like she was in London raising money. She's raking in all this money from all, um, all these GOP supporters, uh, GOP donors that propped up Scott Walker. So what is, if she, if her political career is dead, why is she amassing a war chest right now? What is that for? <laughs> Well, I mean, probably to scare anyone away from challenging her, probably so she could try to run if she decides to run another Democratic primary, which again, I see as unlikely. She can try to run a scorched earth campaign against who that person is, or if she has runs as an independent, you know, I think she fancies herself another John McCain, even though she's never shown any of the political courage that John McCain ever did, that, that she will have the, the resources to be able to do it. And of course, you know, corporate America loves her because the, they go to her and mansion to kill any kind of progressive change in this country. And so, I mean, she has now branded herself this way. The branding is very strange to me, though, because unlike Manchin, who represents a state that Biden lost by 40 points, Biden won Arizona, Mark Kelly won Arizona. Arizona is a competitive state. And so I, I don't know. To me, you'd think she'd be positioning herself more like Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff were positioning themselves. Because Georgia and Arizona were basically the same in terms of the, the margins. Uh, similar electorate, Georgia's more diverse, but Arizona's pretty diverse too. Cinema won because of mobilizations among young voters, mobilizations among voters of color. Yes, she did win sort of the moderate Cindy McCain types, but that's not the only reason she was elected to the Senate. And she just completely turned her back among the people that worked for her, that organized for her, that laid the groundwork so that she and Mark Kelly could be elected and Joe Biden could win that state. And it's baffling to me that she didn't follow the lead of Ossoff and Warnock and really go all out to try to pass this bill. I think if she had, she would have been a lot more popular uh, among Democrats. And I think she would have been totally fine in Arizona. And now her approval ratings are just terrible. And so, I mean, maybe she believed it all. I mean, maybe she she truly believes that you know, maintaining a broken, corrupt voter suppression status quo is the best thing for America. But it's hard to imagine that she sees all the restrictions on voting that are happening in her backyard that could theoretically target her and her supporters and thinks that the idea is that we should do nothing to stop this. 
As Gaslit Nation listeners know, there's a lot going on that makes us want to throw up. The plague, the coup, the wars, the steady assault on our democracy. Well, for once, I've got good news. You can check out Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA-cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. The product is 100% drug-free, non-drowsy, and provides all-natural, long-lasting relief with zero side effects for as long as needed. The technology was developed over 20 years ago in hospitals to relieve nausea for patients, but now, through Relief Band, it's available to the masses. I'm wearing my Relief Band now, and I can tell you it's already easing my existential dread. Thank you, Relief Band. Relief Band makes a great gift for any time of year. Right now, they've got an exclusive offer just for Gaslit Nation listeners. If you go to ReliefBand.com and use promo code GASLIT, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30-day money back guarantee. So head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use our promo code GASLIT for 20% off plus free shipping. So we've been interviewing a lot of experts uh, for this big series we're running in the spring on how to rebuild American democracy from the ashes. And some of the experts we've interviewed, like Nancy McLean um, and others, have talked about this far-right, well-organized, asymmetrical warfare effort going back decades to hijack our democracy. And it's paying off now. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing decades of work by the Koch political network and others. And so one thing you hear a lot, just of chatter, people just speculating because they're so frustrated with cinema, one accusation that does get thrown at her, which could be completely bonkers because it's just, there's a lot of just anger and frustration towards her, is that she's a plant, that she's part of their long game. Do you see any chance of that? Because the way she's just flipped 180, because her earlier speeches as a Green Party activist or, or, or her early years as a Democrat, She's sounding like us. Like she's sounding like we've got to get rid of the filibuster. Like she she sounds like she knows what she's talking about and is and is a grounded person, grounded in values. And then she just flipped so widely. Like I I know money is wonderful. I know it's I know greed is is a hell of a drug, but it, it just the the transformation is so dramatic. Do you see any chance that given any of her past associations that she might have been a long game in some way, shape, or form? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what her motivations are. It's it's very hard to decode them, given how she just seems to be self-destructing politically uh, right now. I, I think that if you look at her career, I think basically she realized that she was never going to get elected as a Green Party organizer in Arizona. And I think so she positioned herself as a blue dog in the House. So, I mean, if you paid attention to her record in the House, what she's doing in the Senate is not that surprising. Um, but she's become even more conservative. And I think she's basically realized that this position will get her a lot of money, will bring her a lot of influence, will put her at the center of things, will make her an indispensable type player. And so that's the political calculation she's made. If she just goes along with the Democratic agenda, then she's just one of 50. Um, But if she is in the center of things, then she can be the kingmaker or the queenmaker. And I think that's been the calculation for Manchin and Cinema. I think they're loving all this attention. The difference between Manchin and Cinema is Manchin's actually willing to talk to people. He's willing to talk to reporters. He's willing to hold meetings. Now, a lot of the meetings he's holding are with rich donors that don't uh, like progressive causes. But I mean, I think he's been fairly open with people and Cinema won't talk to anybody. She won't give press conferences. She won't hold town hall. She did that kind of crying speech on the Senate floor that seemed incredibly fake, but she's not even trying to believe in representative democracy. She's not making herself available as a representative. So I don't know. I don't know what her long game was, but I think that those interests have found her incredibly useful. And they realize that she's a Democrat or who knows how long she'll be a Democrat that they can work with and that they can use. And sometimes you need that. Sometimes, you know, for the coast to succeed and all those interests to succeed. I mean, obviously they needed to elect a lot more Republicans, but they also needed to buy some Democrats off in the process and they've succeeded in doing that. And and you've covered the Democrats for a very long time. How do you think the Democratic leadership did? What did you think of their approach in trying to 
win over Mansion and Cinema. They let Mansion and Cinema sort of be the face of infrastructure when they finally got their big infrastructure bill passed. Cinema was on the stage with Democratic leadership, praising this big bill, giving her a lot of clout in doing that. How do you think Democratic leadership handled that and trying to win them over? And what do you think they should have done differently? I think it was too much of an inside strategy on both Build Back Better and on voting rights. I think the idea was let's cater to mansion cinema behind closed doors. Let's give them everything they want and then they'll come around. And they didn't. They didn't come around on Build Back Better and they didn't come around on voting rights. And I would, I would have liked to see a lot more outside pressure. Now, I know the grassroots groups tried to exert pressure, but generally the view from the Democratic Party was let's handle this internally. Don't be too aggressive with them. We might lose them on key votes. They might leave the party. Well, in the end, you lost them on the key votes anyway. And I would have liked to see Biden exert more pressure on them as well. Biden's position on calling for changes to the filibuster was always, if I call for changes on the filibuster, I'm going to lose these guys on Build Back Better. Well, he lost them on Build Back Better. So Mm -hmm. I think that the president should have been out there much earlier talking about the threats that voters face, uh, talking about how to overcome them and talking about not just the Republicans, but the Democrats that that might have been standing in the way and and put more pressure on them. Because I think ultimately, Manchin and Cinema were able to dictate the agenda rather than the other way around. And some of that's inevitable. Some of that's inevitable in the 50-50 Senate that this is just going to happen. And maybe everyone's expectations were raised too high. Um, But the fact is, if you're going to make this a priority and the Democrats' voting rights bill was the first bill they introduced at the beginning of the Congress. I mean, if if you're going to make this your priority, you have to do everything you can to try to pass it. And instead, it just seems like they let Manchin and Sinema dictate the terms of the debate as opposed to really exerting the kind of pressure on them that might have made them feel like they had no choice but ultimately to go along with what the party wanted. So maybe it was unwinnable. I mean, there's lots of indications that Manchin and Sinema were never going to move on this issue. But the question is, did they feel the ultimate amount of pressure they could have? And I think the answer is no. Well, and also it seems that they, in the process of trying to court uh, Mansion and Cinema and Ben to uh, their, you know, uh, imagined whims, they have lost a core constituency, or at least are at risk of losing it, which is all of the volunteers that turned out uh, for the 2020 election, and especially the volunteers that flipped Georgia blue and got Ossoff and Warnock in. And we've seen their, you know, understandable frustration recently, like when Biden and Harris uh, flew to Georgia and those activists did not want to meet with them because they were tired of empty rhetoric. They want to see action. Uh, We also saw, you know, Stacey Abrams said she had a a scheduling conflict, but it seemed noticeable uh, that she wasn't there. And I think that this is in response to what you were just saying, that, that Biden and Harris also have refused to you know, apply pressure. Um, you know, they've acted as, as sycophants to people who are uh, destroying the democratic process. Like, what is going to happen now? Because you know, obviously people will continue to fight for voting rights, um, but they don't seem to have the backing of this administration. And I think especially younger voters, uh, you know, new voters from 2020 are going to look at this whole process and be like, what's the point? You know, you've abandoned us in our time of need and you didn't fulfill your promises. Like, where do you see that going uh, on the grassroots level? Yeah, and I think that the voting rights groups and the activists and the organizers, they liked what Biden said in Georgia, but they wanted him to say it much earlier mm-hmm. and make it make it much more of a priority and make it one of the top priorities of, of his administration. And, you know, Biden's been going all around the country talking about infrastructure. But if you look at, I mean, he's basically given two speeches about voting rights, one in Philadelphia over the summer and one in Georgia, right before they were going to vote on this bill. I mean, he's not gone on a democracy tour. He has not made protecting American democracy the central organizing principle of his presidency in a way that Republicans have made voter suppression the central organizing principle of their party. And so there's been an asymmetric warfare in terms of tactics, but also just in terms of priorities, that basically what Republicans did is they used the insurrection as a rallying cry for an insurrection through other means so that they don't need to do another insurrection because they're going to rig the election on the front end or the back end in 2022 and 2024. And Democrats have not shown the same kind of urgency to protect American democracy until this last ditch effort in the last few weeks. And and that was not enough in terms of laying the groundwork for this. So 
I understand why people are frustrated. I don't think the answer is to give up, though. I think the answer is to fight harder and figure out what other strategies you need. I mean, one thing that's pretty obvious to me is there were 48 Senate Democrats that were willing to change the Senate rules to pass voting rights legislation. And so the question is, can you get two more in there that are willing to do it? Uh, so Manchin and Cinema no longer hold all the cards. I mean, so I think that's something to really think about it in Senate races in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and other states where Democrats have a shot at winning and elected people have already pledged to change the Senate rules and to weaken or eliminate the filibuster, which I think is really important. And then I think what we really need is a mass mobilization for democracy at the state and local level. Because what's happening in 2020 is so many people showed up to be poll workers and election officials to volunteer for campaigns or grassroots efforts. And a lot of people went back to their lives after the 2020 election. I understand it. We're still in a pandemic. It was a very exhausting election. But the problem is the insurrectionists have filled the void. Every single day, Steve Bannon is recruiting people to be poll workers, to be election judges, to sit on county certification commissions, calling for the overthrow of county election clerks. And this is a very scary prospect that the people that attended the insurrection on January 6th could be the ones counting the votes in 2022 and 2024. And so I think even though people are dispirited, even though there was a failure by the Democrats to fight hard enough to pass this voting rights legislation, there are still things that people can do to protect American democracy. If people just give up and say, I'm done with all of it, then it's very clear to me the insurrectionists are going to take over every aspect of the election process. I have a question about that. You know, you have a new article in Mother Jones, uh, which I hope everybody reads, called The Coming Coup, How Republicans Are Laying the Groundwork to Steal Future Elections. And this is a quote from that article. You wrote, the newest and potentially most dangerous anti-democratic threat are new laws designed to give Trump-backed election deniers unprecedented control over how elections are run and how votes are Counted. So this is rather, uh, you know, Stalinistic. That you know, it's not the people who vote that counts. The people who count the votes uh, that matter. Uh, this is also Roy Cohn's philosophy. This is Donald Trump's philosophy. Um, and now there is, uh, you know, legal backing for this, which didn't exist before. Can you get into that, like how these GOP state legislatures are going to handle ballots? Um, you know, what kind of plans uh, Bannon and other uh, insurrectionists have for uh, controlling this election in 2022 and 2024 and, and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. And, and to me, the, this election subversion is the scariest part of the whole voter suppression process, because it's all kind of the ultimate voter suppression efforts when even if you're overcome the barriers of the ballot box, if your vote is then thrown out by partisan actors, I mean, that's really, really difficult to overcome. And I'll, I'll just give an example of, of how it's working in, in Georgia, for example. Georgia, of course, was the state where Donald Trump tried to overturn the election, where he told the Secretary of State to find uh, 11,780 votes to, to nullify Joe Biden's victory. And then in Georgia, what happened is the legislature removed the secretary of state who stood up to Trump as a chair and voting member of the state election board. The gerrymandered legislature instead gets to appoint a majority of the state election board. The state election board in turn has the ability to take over county election boards that it views as underperforming. So they, they might take over the election board in Fulton County uh, in Atlanta, the most democratic county in the state where the Trump campaign spread all these conspiracy theories in 2020 about suitcases of ballots being counted after poll monitors had left. And then also what's happening is local boards of election are being disbanded in Georgia. Bipartisan boards are being disbanded and they're being replaced with all Republican boards. And not only that, but there is another part of the Georgia law that says that there can be unlimited challenges to voter eligibility. Right-wing groups did this in 2021. They challenged the eligibility of all of these voters in the Senate runoff elections. And ultimately, those challenges were unsuccessful. But now, basically, the State Board of Elections said, you have to hear all these challenges within 10 days or you can be sanctioned by us. So there could be all of these challenges to voter eligibility heard by all of these partisan boards. And that could lead to elections not being certified or votes being thrown out for Democratic candidates. And so that's how the laws are changing. And there's also who is running for these kind of positions. The Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, who certified the 2020 election, he is being primaried by someone, Jody Heiss, who, a Republican member of Congress that voted to overturn the 2020 election. Brian Kemp, the governor, extremely conservative, 
but certified the 2020 election. He is being challenged from the right by David Perdue, who wanted to overturn the 2020 election. And what's happening is Republicans are changing the laws to give them more authority over vote counting. But the people who are also running to oversee these election positions, whether it's at the local level, poll workers or election judges, or the statewide level, secretaries of state, attorneys general, governors, these are people that are sympathetic to the insurrection, that, that want to achieve the, those, those goals through other means. And that, to me, is a really scary prospect, both the combination of how laws are changing to make it harder for votes to be counted accurately, but also who's running for all of these key positions in 2022 and 2024. And then if they get elected in, in 2022, what are they going to do with that power? I mean, they're running for these positions for a reason. I think they're running for these positions to effectuate an outcome like Trump wanted in 2020, but ultimately failed to secure. Yeah. On that note, I'm wondering, what do you make of the culture of threat that's become increasingly common uh, since 2020, where public officials um, are threatened with violence, uh, poll workers are threatened with violence, uh, a lot of these GOP officials who did certify the election were threatened with violence. And in some cases, like with Trump um, and, and Raffensperger, there is evidence, you know, there are phone calls, there is extensive documentation of illegal action and violent behavior, including obviously uh, the attack of, on the Capitol on January 6th. And, uh, you know, even me and with my pessimism, I thought that the DOJ and the Biden administration, uh, purely out of self-interest, out of wanting to protect uh, our country and its sovereignty and its existence and uh, prevent future violent attacks, would address these issues, especially when they are recorded over the phone, on the internet, on video, et cetera. What do you make of the, the lack of action toward you know, those who've perpetrated these publicly documented threats to uh, elected officials and election workers? Yeah, it's baffling because you'd think that preventing the guy that inspired an insurrection and tried to overturn an election from ever being in that position again would be the top priority of the mm -hmm. U.S. government. I mean, that, that would seem to be the number one priority in a free and fair election in a democracy was to try to prevent the guy that tried to overthrow American democracy from being able to do it again. And far from preventing him from doing it, his side is winning. I mean, the insurrectionists are winning right now, this battle to control American democracy and to subvert American democracy. And I think that the kind of things you're seeing at the local level, pushing out election officials, poll workers, and replacing them with insurrectionists. I mean, that is the playbook that you guys have studied in authoritarian countries all across the world. I mean, it's not quite as bad as, as receiving a horse's head in your bed, <laughs> a la The Godfather. But I mean, it's pretty similar in terms of the kind of tactics they're using to just make life so miserable for people that just want to conduct free and fair elections that they no longer want to do it. And then, and then the insurrectionists fill the void. And so I think this battle has to be fought at the federal level, but I think this battle also has to be fought at the state and local level as well. Obviously, they're now impaneling a grand jury in Georgia to look into what Trump did. Uh, we'll see where it goes. This has a little bit of shades of the Mueller report all over again to me, where people are going to get very excited about an investigation that probably won't reach the outcome they like, but who knows? Maybe it will. Maybe it will. Maybe they will. Maybe Trump will be convicted. Maybe he'll never run again. Um, I guess that would be the optimistic scenario. It seems hard to imagine it actually happening. Um, but I do think that just overall, we need an overarching democracy strategy. And it would be one that would be from the top all the way to the bottom. And at the top level, it would be preventing the people who tried to overthrow an election from ever getting in a position to do it again, preventing laws from being passed that would effectuate that outcome from being put into place, preventing people that did their jobs in 2020 from being removed or forced out of them. I mean, this is all part of an overarching strategy here. And I just, I don't see the urgency on any of these points by Democrats to prevent it from happening. And so I, I'm very worried that even though the last coup failed in 2020, all of the steps are being put in place for another one to succeed in 2022 or 2024. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you on the lack of urgency. And, you know, one of the things that the Republicans have been very skilled at doing for decades is looking for loopholes and looking for uh, unconventional ways to achieve power without technically breaking the law. So I've been sort of keeping my eye out for potential loopholes here. And one article that I found, even though it came out about a year ago, but recently is by Hayes Brown um, from MSNBC, who wrote an article saying uh, Vice President Kamala Harris could kill the filibuster herself. And this is a small quote from it. It says, Harris should be ready and willing to use the power she has to steer the Senate if need be, and particularly taken with the idea that lawyer and author Thomas uh, Gagoan suggested in a 2010 New York Times op-ed, if the votes aren't there to change the rules, the vice president could issue an opinion from the chair that the filibuster is unconstitutional. So basically he's saying Harris could issue a, a parliamentary ruling, just saying, you know, no more filibuster and therefore, you know, they get rid of it and, and and pass their agenda. Is this actually possible? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. That's that's something that I don't. I hadn't studied enough. It, it, it wasn't coming up a lot in discussions I was having about the filibuster. So I assume not. But I, I to be honest with you, I don't know. So I don't want to speculate too much on that. One thing I'm concerned about, though, is now that the voting rights bills, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act appear dead. There's this new effort to try to reform the Electoral Count Act of 1887. And I don't want to go too in the weeds here, but basically this was the law that that controls how Congress counts electoral votes. And of course, what you saw in 2020 was Trump trying to get Mike Pence to basically not count the electoral votes uh, under the very confusing language of the Electoral Count Act. Now, Congress is trying to revise it, which is probably good. Not a substitute for the voting rights bills, but probably a good idea to revise it. But here's what I worry about. One thing they could say is the vice president has no power to alter electoral college votes. Well, what if Republican legislatures in Georgia and other states decide not to follow the popular vote winner in their states and actually send these pro-Trump electors to Congress, like the Trump campaign wanted in 2020. And then Kamala Harris can't do anything about it because the Congress rewrote the Electoral Count Act in a way that actually makes it harder to prevent election subversion. So that's, that's I don't, again, I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but it's worrisome that basically through this reforming the Electoral Count Act process, they could actually make it so that it would be harder to stop a stolen election, uh, not easier to prevent one. And so we'll see where this is going right now. But right now, Republicans have a lot of different angles to try to influence the stealing of an election. And Democrats haven't done a good job at all of stopping those actions from being taken right now. Do you think Democrats are aware of, of what you just said, you know, of these potential dangers? Because I feel like they're not, they're not discussing them if they are. I feel like they're aware of that, but they're not raising the alarm. I mean, you don't have the Steve Bannon type saying, you know, every single day, uh, become a poll worker, become an election official, uh, do all of these kind of things, work at the local and county level. You don't see Secretary of State races and state AG races and, and these kind of races getting the same amount of attention on the left compared to the right. And maybe that will change in 2022. But the thing that I'm worried about is that what happens in 2022 is going to determine to a large extent whether there's even going to be a fair election in 2024. Because if all of these insurrectionists take over county election boards, if they win secretary of state races, if they control key positions in the legislature, I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to have a fair election in 2024, either because voting is going to be so difficult, people won't be able to vote, or even if they overcome these obstacles, then all of the chicanery with accounting that Trump wanted in 2020 will come into play in 2024, meaning that the people that certify the election in 2020, they, they will have been replaced. The Republicans that certify the elections will have been replaced by people that don't want to certify elections if Democrats win them. And I don't think there's enough of a sense of urgency here from the Democratic Party. I mean, I think basically the position of Biden was, let's pass sensible bipartisan policies and that will break the fever in Washington. Well, First off, they haven't passed enough of those policies. And number two, the fever wasn't going to break either way. Um, mm -hmm. The fever has only gotten worse in the Republican Party right now. Whatever it was, it's if it was 102, now it's 104 uh, in terms of where the fever is right now. And Democrats 
aren't doing enough to stop it, and they're not doing enough to proactively pass legislation that will give them something to run on in 2022. And so it, it's shaping up to potentially be a very ugly midterm election, not just an ugly midterm election where Democrats would find themselves out of power, but a, an ugly midterm election in which insurrectionist Republicans would find themselves in power. And these are not going to be the same Republicans that were even elected in 2020. These are going to be much more extreme people that I think will be a will, a willing to abuse their power of their office in ways that we haven't seen in a very long time, if, if ever. I want to just jump in there with a question. First, I want to make a point on the parliamentarian uh, vice president solution. And obviously, if Kamala Harris came in to the Senate and said, there's no more filibuster, you would have Manchin and Cinema with withholding their votes or voting no or voting present to protect the filibuster on their principled stand of protecting minority rights, right? So that that solution is a non-solution. Um, the second thing is I wanted to ask, you've been covering Democrats for a very long time. Do you see any strategy at all that they're going to try to protect their party from any future cinemas? Meaning Where's the Coke political network money going now? Where's the U.S. Chamber of Commerce money going now? Like, which members of Congress could be co-opted next? So if, if the grassroots are being depended on to protect our democracy by voting in overwhelming numbers and waiting in long lines for hours, and yet we're bringing in people to Congress who are being bought off, like, why can't the Democrats weed out those members from their party? Like, why can't they be vigilant and say, if you accept money from the U.S. chamber, you're gone. That kind of gets at why some of the dark money stuff was in the Freedom to Vote Act in the first place, because it has bipartisan influence. And I mean, the idea that the Republicans are the only ones that are bought off by corporate America is clearly not true. And, and I've thought for a long time that the way our campaign finance system works, the way our our elections are run, just incentivizes corruption. And I mean, the, the dark money stuff in the Freedom to Vote Act was a good start, but it didn't go nearly far enough. And we have a, a series of harmful Supreme Court decisions, not just Citizens United, but this whole idea that money is speech has just opened up a huge door to political corruption that is very, very difficult to unwind in both parties. Um, to the point I made earlier, I mean, I think that's one reason why it's important to elect more Democrats. I mean, when Harry Reid changed the Senate rules so that they could actually appoint Barack Obama's judges, they had 55 Democratic senators. They didn't have 50. They lost three Democrats, one of whom was Joe Manchin. So there would have never been any kind of rule change if there had been 53 senators instead of 55. And so it's very, very difficult to do things with 50-50 majorities. And I think people got their expectations raised because Democrats did control Washington, but they controlled Washington on such a marginal extent when you consider that Manchin and Cinema were the people that you had to get through to pass anything. And they sort of fell in line early on with the coronavirus relief package, and they negotiated an infrastructure bill that honestly could have been signed by Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon or any Republican president. There wasn't anything particularly progressive about it. But when it, when it came down to actually do big, bold things, they stood in the way. And I think that's the problem with having 50 Democrats. And so I think one of the solutions here is to try to elect more Democrats, but it's hard to elect more Democrats when the Democratic Party doesn't seem to have a message that responds to people's needs and doesn't have a message that democracy is under threat and we're going to protect it. And that to me is the problem here. One of the solutions, not the only solution, is to elect more Democrats, but the people that are killing the Democratic agenda are making it a lot harder to do that because how can Raphael Warnock or Mark Kelly go back home and say, reelect me when Cinema and Mansion have just pulled the rug out from under them? And so that, that's the conundrum that they face right now. And it's not an easy one to get around. So there's a lot of incredible grassroots organizations that support Democrats. And there's a, there are a lot of dynamic Democratic leaders. So where is this vacuum of power coming from in the Democratic Party in terms of their abysmal messaging? Is it because it's the same people that have been in the system for so long and they just have this racket of loyalty of who gets the big contracts for running campaigns and being consultants and so forth that they're just uh, become so complacent? What's the sort of surgical move here to remove whatever's standing in the way from taking advantage of all the great talent that is out there in the, the grassroots movement, the Democratic, on the Democratic Party side, what's standing in the way of that? 
Well, I mean, we need more Warnocks and fewer mansions. I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, you look at someone like Reverend Warnock. I mean, he was he was a preacher. He was an organizer. He was not a politician. And I think that's one reason why he, he's so refreshing and why he's so elegant is because he hasn't played that same kind of political game his entire life compared to someone like Joe Manchin, who's just been a lackey of the coal interests and a product of the, the corrupt West Virginia political machine uh, for so many years. And I think that there's a there's a way to rise through the ladder in both parties, and it's it's it usually is the people that check all the boxes on their resumes that are able to be the best fundraisers that do all those kind of things, uh, and ultimately that doesn't appeal to a lot of people. I think that's why people are cynical about the political process, and I think they feel like that that both parties uh, are kind of bought off here, and, and I mean, it, and it's hard to argue with that when you see some of the results right now, and so. I would like to see just new faces in the Democratic Party and understand that, yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of problems with the Republican Party. But I think also the Democratic Party is far from perfect right now either. Uh, and, you know, they nominated an old white guy because they felt like that was the guy that would beat Donald Trump. But he was never the most inspiring guy in the first place. And now that he, his approval rating is lower, he's a lot less inspiring than he was before. And so I think the Democratic Party is in need of new blood here. And I think that that was obvious throughout this entire debate over voting rights and just in general in the last two years, that that's just status quo politics is probably not going to cut it right now, particularly when you have a Republican Party that's just radicalizing by the day, by the moment. So in terms of chances in, in 2022, I remember all the pundits saying that there's no way the Democrats would take Georgia, and then they pulled off a miracle, taking both Senate seats. What is your scenario for uh, the Democrats pulling off a miracle in the midterms, at least holding on to both chambers, even if we're still stuck where we are? What path needs to happen? Well, I mean, first off, there's going to have to be a tremendous amount of voter education and voter mobilization at the local level to overcome some of these restrictions on voting, because we're already seeing the impact of them. Like in Texas, we're seeing after they passed a new voter ID law for mail ballots, we're seeing the number of rejected mail ballots increase by 700% in, in large urban counties. And so we're already starting to see the impact of these restrictions because the laws that were passed in 2021 are going into effect now in 2022. So we're going to need to see a huge level of mobilization against these efforts like we saw in 2020 when so many people put an emphasis on how to have your vote counted and cast correctly during a pandemic. We're still in that similar situation today. And then I think the Democratic Party is going to have to convince voters that they stand for something and that if you reelect them, that they're going to do something, that they're going to keep pushing to change the filibuster rules to pass voting rights legislation, that they're going to keep trying to push on climate change and abortion rights and all these other things that people care about. Right now, I mean, that that message isn't getting out there. It feels very passive. Like every single day, the Republican Party is out there recruiting more and more people to try to overthrow future elections. Uh, and the Democratic Party is losing people to knock on doors, to become poll workers, to run for campaigns. And so th that asymmetry is, is really what needs to change. And, and I think that we need to realize 2022 is not a normal midterm election. Yes, you can be frustrated with the Democratic Party, but if you don't vote, if you don't participate, the insurrectionists are going to take power. And once they take power, they're not going to give it up willingly. And so I think that we need to frame the 2022 election as a referendum on American democracy, because I don't think people are seeing it that way. I think they saw it that way in 2020, but I don't think they're seeing it that way in 2022. I think they're even, a lot of people aren't even paying attention right now uh, to the things that are going on. And, and voter turnout always decreases in a midterm election, um, but it, it can't be a catastrophic decrease. And it can't just be that the insurrectionists have all the momentum, but all the people that believe in American democracy decide that they don't want to participate for one reason or another, and then it opens the door to the insurrectionists taking over. Who are the grassroots organizers and organizations that are doing valuable work right now to mobilize voters? A lot of groups doing uh, good work. Um, in the Southern states, Black Vot Voters Matter is a great organization. There's lots of groups that are doing voter protection work, uh, like the, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. There's groups that have been working you know, in places like Georgia, like the New Georgia Project, place, groups that are working in Arizona, um, like Lucha, that have been organizing for a long time. So there's a, there's a lot of groups that, that are out there. Uh, and I, I think that if you're frustrated with the Democratic Party, 
work at the grassroots level. You don't have to work for Democrats. You can work for groups that believe in American democracy and, and you can support it that way because these groups have been fighting the good fight. They're not the ones to blame here for what's happening. They're doing everything they can uh, to try to protect voting rights, to try to mobilize voters. It's just that they really needed this federal legislation to get them over the hump because basically that would have been a huge asset. All of these laws that would have made it easier to vote, that would have stopped election subversion, would have made it so much easier to organize voters. And now it's state by state. It's a long, hard slog. It's not unprecedented. It's what we've been dealing with for the last decade. Um, but nonetheless, it, it is difficult to fight these battles county by county, state by state, locality after locality. But that's where we're at right now. And so I think that people just need to just need to dig in and realize that you know the solution is not going to happen overnight. But not participating in 2022 will make it so much harder to fight for democracy in 2024 or in the future. So final question. Biden did pass some executive orders last time we spoke uh, to protect voting rights. Do those matter? Or do they all come down to state level enforcement? There's a limited amount that the federal government can do when it comes to voting. And we've seen some executive orders by Biden, but it, it sort of tinkers around the edges the Justice Department has litigated in certain states. They've sued Georgia. They've sued Texas. I would like them to file more lawsuits. Now, the problem is those lawsuits are going before conservative-dominated courts, including ultimately the Supreme Court. So this is one of these areas where we might disagree, but I understand why they've been cautious, because you know whatever lawsuit you file is going straight up to John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, and unlikely to achieve uh, a good outcome. But there's still things the Justice Department can do outside of litigation to prevent voter intimidation, to enforce what remains of the Voting Rights Act. And so I'd like them to use those tools. Uh, there's obviously been lots of litigation filed at the local level as well. But I mean, it, there's not one thing that you need to do now. You need to do everything right now. I mean, you need to use the power of the presidency. You need to use the power of the Justice Department. You need to use all of the tools available at the state and local level to defend American democracy. The federal legislation would have by far have been the most effective way to combat these voter suppression efforts. That's why it was such a big push by Senate Democrats to pass these things, because it would have done so much to stop these kind of efforts. But failing that, it, it really is kind of an all of the above approach. Uh, and it's not something that's going to succeed overnight, but it takes a, a lot of pushing and a lot of hard work to try to protect voting rights and that's where, that's where we're at right now, and I, I just hope that it succeeds. Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, Donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Bissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Jess Sauer, Chick Quinn, Lily Wachowski, Megan McNearney, Sean Rubin, Todd S. Perlstein, Pat, Kenny Main, John Schoenthaler, Frank Jaquette, Ellen McGirt, Joe Farron, Larry Gasson, Erica Moore, Karen A. Deal, Nico Phillips, Brian E. Castor, Lex Reed, Andrea Scalzo, or Andrea Scalzo, we don't know, uh, Karen Heisler, Jordan Sanders, 
Ann Bertino, T.R. Dunstan, John Millette, David East, Stu, Shannon Nacy, Ida, Chris Fellow, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Halcom, Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Barbara Kittredge, Matthew Womack, Silas Frank, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Benjamin Galuza, Kat Gillis, Kai Gillis, Ah, Kai Gillis, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hatrick, Irv Robinson, William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Yvonne Q, Mike Christensen, Sandra Kalmans, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, Jeff Thompson, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstadt, Michael Wood, <laughs> I'm, my eyes are watery, Michael Woodridge, Woldridge, Woldridge, Crimer, no criming. <laughs> <laughs> this always makes me laugh. I've said it so many times. I think it's all that Dora the Explorer era of my children's life. Anyway, go on. Every time. Jason Benke. Joe Darcy. Anne Marshall. Jeremy Lewis. Joel Newman. Trigve. Christine M. D.L. Singfield. Matt Perez. Nicole Spear. Brian Tajudin. Maureen Murphy. Michelle Dash. Abby Road. <laughs> I don't know. Is that a, it may be a rude name. I don't know. I, it's a cool name. It's a cool name. We're pro we're your name thrilled. no we're matter what here. it is. Jans Alstrup Rasmussen. Victoria Olson. Alabama. ZW. Jason Bainbridge. Sarah Gray. Mike Tripico. Diana Gallagher. John Ripley. Ethan Mann. Piet Yitzma. David Porter. Kate Cotton. Kim Mellon. Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Jared Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, Eric Kaplan, Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all so much for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you.